kindly state your name and position in the organization? Of course. Uh, I'm Dr. Daniel Novak, uh, Professor of Clinical Medical Education at the Keck School of Medicine uh, at the University of Southern California. And my work uh, is predominantly concerned with um, supporting uh, the transition to active learning exercises uh, in uh, the, our medical school and MD program. So, so uh, your position, so with the, the LDT program, has it, how has it pre prepared for you for this position in the company or the institution? One thing I think the LDT program it does an excellent job of doing is really um, systematically taking a person through the dimensions of instructional design. So fundamentally, instructional design is about aligning um, objectives, content, and modality in such a way as to really help students move through these things systematically and, and to uh, come out in, in a way that with uh, the kinds of thinking that, that we need them to have at the end of this, the kinds of abilities we need them to have at the end. And um, I think the, the LDT program really does a great job of helping people understand that process and also how to apply that process in real world contexts, whether it's in schools, in higher education, or in industry. Okay, uh, from our past conversation about the LDT program at San Diego State, um, it was like a decade ago. So how did you get into the program itself? Well, actually, it's funny because I was um, looking around at graduate programs at the time. Um, and uh, my father worked in the CSU system and he had heard about uh, this field. He knew about instructional design from his own work. And he said, this is a field that's going to grow. He said, this is go into this field because there will always be jobs. Uh, and it's going to explode with the growth of educational technology, which is what we called it at the time. And not only was he right, he's, uh, you know, as we're finding with online, the demand for online education right now at this very moment uh, when this is recorded in COVID times, um, there's an even greater, I'm seeing job positions come out all the time. There are always, there's always a demand for this. So um, I kind of accidentally, you know, accidentally worked my way into it, but I'd already been working in um, uh, uh, kind of what we might think of as like uh, multimedia instructional design in its very, in a very primitive form in my undergraduate work. So my transition right out, I'm kind of a, an unusual um, person in that case because I didn't have an intermediary career and then transition into uh, ed tech or learning technology or learning design te and technology. I really started out in that field and that's been my profession for, you know, 15, I think I graduated uh, 12 years ago. So um, it's been a long road since then, but uh, I think the LDD program definitely equipped me to um, to to uh, handle all the various challenges and the different kinds of roles that I've inhabited since that time. Okay, um, from the program in the past, like uh, did anything like stick out to you? Like uh, had impacted you? A memorable incident situation? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I had a great a lot of great opportunities when I worked at. Um, uh, LDT, I mean, the, the most important one was really actually at the end of the program in my last year, I uh, was able to, you, you know, because of the strong community in uh, Southern California and in San Diego, I was able to get an internship with Qualcomm, which I eventually worked at immediately following my graduation. And Qualcomm, um, because they had a number of uh, ed tech and LDT um, uh, alumni there, they really valued uh, uh, instructional design and they really had a whole department I was dedicated to producing online instructional materials. So all the stuff that I was learning in the multimedia design classes that really easily transferred into the work over there. Um, and also a lot of the stuff, I mean, things that I thought were really, really important were uh, some of our intro to instructional design courses involved um, uh, kind of uh, some, some overviews of things like cognitive science that wound up being, I think the, the foundational uh, uh, dimensions of, of instructional design that are important today. Things like cognitive load theory, those are like really important grounding and formative uh, uh, things that I learned that I'm continuing to use many years later. And that we're only finding now are actually uh, even more important than we thought. So that, that was really huge for me, um, both in terms of what I learned and what I was able to do in the program. So um, what does a typical day at work, you know, uh, how does it look like? Um, so, I mean, I think as with most people, I, I work in an office and I work with, uh, so for me, um, I am both uh, an academic, a scholar. So I do research on uh, the programs that we, we do. And I do, um, you know, way, I try to find ways to expand what we know about um, learning and, and what we would call the learning sciences. 
Um, but also I have very um, specific kind of in, in a, like in a clinical way, I work with faculty to develop their technology. So I have a very uh, practical and practice-based uh, aspect to my work as well. So in addition, you know, uh, on, on what some days I may be, um, you know, uh, performing statistical calculations and determining whether the educational uh, endeavors that we um, are trying out are actually working. And in other days, uh, I might be meeting with faculty, uh, for example, just today, I was meeting with faculty to, to plan out an active learning session uh, in a couple of months. And so we're going to do one on, this is in uh, our reproduction block, uh, we're talking about doing one on um, uh, disparities in reproductive care. So why is it that some people in our society um, have worse outcomes than other people, uh, all things all else being equal. So um, we're going to do some uh, really exciting active learning work with our students on that. Um, and just as one example, a couple of months ago, I, I did some work with somebody in the OBGYN uh, area of, of our, our medical program uh, in the clerkship phase. That's when our, our students in their, their second and third years go out and they start working in clinical contexts with their, their instructors. So I helped um, uh, our, one of our instructors there to refactor what used to be these lunchtime lectures that students would typically just sleep through and refactor them into um, uh, uh, online, or uh, sorry, uh, active learning sessions that were small group based using a, a, a kind of an adapted version of a methodology called team-based learning. And what uh, evolved out of that was actually we were able to see that year of that from the previous year to the next year, there was a statistically significant improvement in the students' ratings of that of those sessions. So by making it more active, we were actually able, and then also using the data that we collected from that, we we're able to make an argument that this is probably, you know, maybe not every single one of these clerkship lunchtime things or, or uh, didactic periods should should look exactly like this. But that certainly this is better that or perform, you know, students like it more than other things. So um, uh, I think, you know, obviously the next layer out would then be to illustrate that that it uh, leads to better outcomes, but we, we haven't quite got there yet. So, uh -huh. so um, that was your normal day. So how has the pandemic affected uh, affect the, 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 the routine, so to speak? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think that's interesting because uh, you know, uh, for years and years now, uh, really since my own time in the, in the uh, ed tech and LDT program, um, it has been in some ways a hard sell to convince people that online learning is a way, the, you know, like we talk about it as the wave of the future, upper administrators in higher education have been advocating for it for a long time, but actually convincing faculty that they need to develop the skills to teach online and that it's not just knowledge dumps, you know, through lectures and that kind of stuff. That's been um, a challenge, but COVID really, I think as with every other aspect that COVID has touched in our society, it's accelerated those changes. So faculty now are saying, well, we don't have a choice. I have to teach online, so I'd better learn. And that's been great for us because um, we think that that's an important, you know, we think that good teaching can manifest in any environment, but you have to really adapt and, and learn. So I think coming, you know, going into COVID, we've really had to teach online. Uh, for example, our patient-centered digital health course that I designed and built in our online platform, um, all of a sudden that went from like, oh, maybe it'll be nice if we can teach some uh, distance and blended uh, courses uh, to our, our fourth years who have to travel around to their residencies. We could just deliver this online. Now we've had to, we actually had to roll it out and, and start teaching it right away a couple months ago to our, our mainline medical students uh, in their second, third, and fourth years because we needed online courses uh, in order to buy some time for uh, our other projects to move online. So um, it, it's, it's actually been uh, in some ways a good thing for online learning and we're learning and the upside is we're learning all about the limitations. We're learning all about, you know, things we already knew we're, we're seeing confirmed, things we didn't know that would happen if you moved online in scale. We're learning about that. We're learning about how to use and conduct active learning sessions online. Uh, we just have been conducting online, what we used to do in person was these team-based learning sessions. We had to figure out how to refactor those in-person sessions from last year into online Zoom sessions for this year. So it's, um, it's, it's actually been quite a good thing in some ways for online learning. Uh, and and in, in some ways, you know, I, I think it, it's also been good for getting connected to students. Uh, I think when you have 25 students or in, you know, in, in your class, um, it's hard sometimes in person to, to get to know all of them. 
but I think you do get an opportunity because you can just, you know, uh, jump into a, 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 your, your uh, Zoom room with a student and talk about their project. You can really learn a little bit more about what their interests are and you can point them to better resources and things like that. So even on just a, a personal teaching level, I think it's been really, uh, if you have a good attitude and you have the right skills, it can be a very positive ex experience for both the instructor and the student. So uh, with the, the pandemic that happened, so the direction of LDT is sort of like happening now. This is the future. It's is there well, more I, to come, more to expect. Let's say we're back to normalcy, so to speak. Um, how does I, LDT look? Uh, well, I think it's interesting. We um, have been talking about that as a potential, like what happens when when things are back to normal. And I think you know, broadly, both within the medical community uh, and within. Um, the instructional design community, I don't know that normal is going to look the way it ever did before. Like there's, there has been, I mean, there's a great, great book on um, uh, that, that projected, it, it was from about, I think, 2010. And uh, it did a great job. It's um, uh, Rethinking Education in the Age of Technology is what it's called. And it was from some very leading educational scholars. And, and they thought about, they projected forward into the future and they thought about what this, what, what our school system would look like if we kind of, if these trends continue now, they were projecting for like 2040, you know, way in the future and COVID really bumped up the timetable and a lot of this stuff. But the idea of having a, you know, school is going to class, sitting through five 50 minute periods, like that's gonna really transition, um, I think going forward. And, and the expectation that we're gonna just go back to, to the way things were is, is probably not 100% accurate. And by the time we could safely transition back in two to three years, um, people may not have the stomach for it anymore, sitting in, in traffic to drive to, to university. Um, on the one hand, campus life, universities uh, and higher education are in kind of a rock and a hard place because part of the expectation, part of my own experience in higher education is the incredible opportunity to sit in a room with scholars, talk with them, get to know them and, and hear about their work in the buildings in a physical location that um, is imbued with its own history. And I think that's wonderful. And, and I want to figure out how we can preserve that. On the other hand, there are real health and safety issues that cannot be ignored. And even following this, I mean, we just as a society uh, accepted that everybody gets the flu every year or that some non-zero number of people are gonna get infected with uh, pathogens because they have to go and sit in school and breathe in each other's air all day. Um, I, you know, as much as I love the experience of being in a class, on the other hand, you know, we, we were just uncritical about that. Maybe now we should think about do we need to hold all of these sessions online? Can we have mixed online and in-person sessions that are safer to, to have? And can that even be a better experience than what we had accepted as the normal of going to school and, and uh, sitting in class and all that kind of stuff? So I think this is just the beginning of what we're gonna see. Um, I mean, I'd love to make a prediction about virtual reality or any of those kinds of things. We're just not seeing it yet. Like, there hasn't been an explosion in adoption of virtual reality in higher education yet. We may see it in three to five years, uh, but I just think the cost to benefit rate, if you know, COVID had happened in 2030, maybe after 10 years of virtual reality gradually getting cheaper and more available, we would have had a better uptake of some more exotic technologies to facilitate the feeling of being in a class. But just where we are now, um, Technologies like Zoom and all that are, are really uh, where, where it's at, you know, and, and uh, video conferencing technologies are really where, where we're kind of not stuck, but where we're stationed at the moment. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, for <clears throat> the current LDT students and potential students, what sort of like advice could you give them? Um, well, there, there's kind of two things. Um, uh, I would actually, you know, kind of divide it into LDT to be a really great practitioner of instructional design. And part of things people got to remember, there's no meaningful certification for instructional design out there. Um, there's no way, you know, anyone can just call themselves an instructional designer, right? So one thing LDT does, though, is I think it really in, in, it integrates you into the community of uh, educational technology and instructional design. And that's something that's really important because it helps you to understand the two dimensions that I think are important, which are the research dimension, which is using the best, I think the best instructional designers I know, the best um, learning designers and learning scientists I know, use science, use what we're learning about human social psychology 
in educational contexts to really augment and improve the designs that they produce with their clients. So they don't just uh, go in there and say, oh, I know all about, let's for just uh, team-based learning. So I'm gonna cram everything into team-based learning. Anyone who calls themselves an instructional designer can probably do that, but it really takes someone to think, well, what is the best use of our, um, what is the best way to integrate the technology and the content and the, the teaching model, you know, to that ties these all things to all these things together. And, and science can really inform us about that and using research-based practices can really do that. The other aspect is, I think, um, what people should be aware of and should know is, is to reflect on your own practice all the time. And to think about how is it that, you know, you think back to projects in your past. I uh, uh, keep a little kind of portfolio of my projects. I go back and look at them and I think about what have I learned since then that could really make the next project better. And, and it is hard to see, I was just uh, ruminating the other day about, it, it's hard to see sometimes your progress from one to the other, but you do find that um, you, you, know, you make different mistakes and you make uh, new mistakes. But you know, if you think about your practice and you are a reflective practitioner, you can really uh, up your game continuously over your career span uh, without um, really, uh, uh, with, with continuous learning, you, you can continuously integrate new knowledge into it. So you're, you're really going to become a better practitioner over time. So the earlier you start that, the better your results will be. So research, reflective practice, you put that together, you can build and develop a really great career. Oh, that's great. That's good advice. Great advice. <laughs> um, so Dr. Novak, um, with your experience at the LDT program at San Diego, San Diego State, uh, can you describe the program, your experience in totality into one single word? Uh, I, uh, I am going to go with, I know this is an obvious one, but I think design is an important word to unpack for this one, right? So there's, there's a lot of things we could talk about innovation, we could talk about things, but the word I think that, that really is enduring in value, the thing that I learned is to think as a designer, which is to understand, get into the client's shoes and really think about what it is that they need their learners or themselves to accomplish, depending on who your client is, what is it they actually want and need? And uh, sometimes actually it's even more important to think about what they need than what they want. Those can often be two different things. But design is that process of perspective taking. It's getting into the mind. I think that through the projects you do in the LDT program, through the experiences you have working with, even in the realistic uh, 795A and B projects where you're learning about, uh, I don't know if maybe the numbers have changed, but when I was in, those were our client-based projects, where uh, you actually work for somebody and you produce something they need, getting into their minds and seeing what it is that that's of most importance to of greatest importance to them is is important, and that's the heart of design. That's the, really the key thing is that empathy with your client. And um, so uh, maybe actually the better word is not even design; it's empathy. <laughs> it's, it's the thing. Oh, okay. Maybe that's the word I'm I'm looking for is is uh, empathy. Um, that's more important than design, but getting into people's minds that way really helps you to produce a better quality uh, a product and, and something that I think is worthy of being called instructionally designed. That is, somebody's thought through how do we move people from where they are in terms of their thinking, in terms of their abilities, you know, systematically to get them to where they need to be to accomplish their tasks. And then and, and doing that process is something I think you really do learn in uh, the LDT program. Oh, we just had that lecture about empathy. <laughs> it's like right. your relationship with the client or the person and then how you get, yeah, that's, oh, I agree. <laughs> that's a better word, I guess. And there's a lot of really great uh, research on the importance of uh, what we might think of as perspective taking. And, and um, it's actually kind of metacognition, thinking about the minds of other people, right? Uh, and understanding what is their value from where they stand in the point. And that actually leads to a lot of, uh, it, it leads to number one, avoiding problems, right? Like things like misdesigning um, uh, instructional materials and things like that. If you're in the mind of the learner and in the space of both the learner and your client, you can help to uh, make sure you scaffold them properly across the learning experience. So they wind up with better quality uh, educational experiences, but it also not just helps avoid problems, it helps um, drive innovation in the sense that you might be able, but from using your skills and knowledge by putting yourself in their perspective and in their position, you might be able to come up with new solutions for learning uh, products that uh, actually are better for the person than even they might have thought of needing, right? Like, I think we've all had this experience. You go in, um, somebody's like, oh, I need an online course for this. And you're like, well, 
do you really need an online course or what do you actually need to do? And the answer might be something more like, I need my, my employees to stop such and such. Well, the answer is not necessarily an online course. The answer may be something else completely. You got to see why it is those employees are making those mistakes. And, and that's, I think, the heart of something um, they, they used to teach, but I think has actually gotten kind of absorbed more broadly into LDT is um, performance improvement and those kinds of things, which is to look for things that are preventing people from performing properly, to develop materials that support them in the moment of need, as opposed to the uh, in the classroom, right, outside of the moment of need, away from the moment of need, uh, to provide immediate feedback on people, from people when they, when mistakes are made, that kind of stuff is, is really crucial as well. So, so yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, well, Dr. Novak, thank you for, for your time, and this was very enlightening. Oh, Thank you. I didn't realize we got all the way through the questions, but uh, I'm glad, and I'll uh, share this back over to you. That last answer, you may want to trim down a little bit because I kind of went all over the place. But oh well, yeah, uh, it's gonna be like yeah, empathy. The I have a another group mate who's gonna design the video, so I'll make sure. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'll do is uh, let me let me stop the recording, yeah. and then um, uh, as soon as.